Hello everyone, my name is Yaniv and today we will be talking about neural reverse engineering of street binaries using augmented control flow graphs. This is a joint work with Uri and Aran from the Technium. In recent years, great progress has been made using machine learning to help programmers understand, write and fix their code. On the other hand, there hasn't been a lot of progress in addressing similar problems for binaries. Why is that? Well, when writing source code, programmers follow common patterns. These patterns employ sequences of syntactic structures defined by the language. The language also defines many global symbols, which can be used as anchors. These include types, class structures, and frameworks. In short, source code is rich, structured, expressive, and filled with hints, which facilitates learning. On the other hand, this assembled binary code is machine-generated, adhering to hardware specifications and limitations, has few simple control flow instructions, specifically jump and call, and sometimes interrupts, and is usually optimized, causing entanglement in computation flows and generating code according to the execution context. This means that the same semantics will syntactically be expressed in many different ways. In essence, this assembled binary code is a long, unstructured sequence of low-level operations. These put a lot of pressure on the model because there is a lot of variation across the different examples, making it difficult to capture reoccurring patterns. Our key idea is to use binary program analysis to create a compact and rich representation. We will recover the flow, recover the structure, and distill many computations into each component of our representation. To do that, we will create a control graph to capture the flow and populate it with augmented call sites to capture high-level operations. Our motivating task is naming procedures in binaries. This is extremely helpful for reverse engineers. Their main problem is they don't know where to start. And wherever they do start, they don't know where they are or what other procedures are involved. This forces them to analyze a large portion of the code before they can answer even the simplest of questions. Given a predicted name for all of the procedures will allow them to know where to start where they are, and what other procedures are being involved. Overall, this will save them a lot of time and effort, and will allow them to focus on the right procedure to analyze. Now we can move to describing our approach. At first, we'll extract paths from the CFG. These are simple paths without loops. We will stitch their basic blocks together into one instruction sequence. Examining this sequence, we see that the APIs will, uh, API calls will appear again and again in the different procedures and different executables. This makes them a good anchor for our representation. We will reconstruct a call site for each API call. We will use the library information to ascertain the number of arguments being used at the call and the calling convention to understand which registers are used, used to pass these arguments. After reconstructing the call sites, we remind ourselves that in the original C code, there was a lot more information. There were the names of the variables being used and some concrete values. While the names of the variables cannot be reconstructed, we will use data flow analysis to reason about the register values at the time of the call. For example, we see that RDX is a straightforward case of being assigned the, the concrete value 16 just before the call. But in these two other cases, a more complex set of instructions constructs the value. Keeping in mind that we want a compact representation, we will augment the call sites by using concrete or abstracted values. When a concrete value is available, for example, integer, an enum, or a string, we will use that. In, the other, in other cases, we will use four abstract abstractions which provide some information about the value being passed as an argument. In our case, we have four abstractions, arg, marking procedure argument, global, marking a pointer to a global variable, ret, marking a return value from another procedure call, and stack, marking a pointer to a stack memory, which usually hints that this is a local variable. 
We also add the no information abstraction for cases in which we don't have information about the value. As you can uh, see, as we move down the list, the abstraction and the information we have are less informative. This is why we will give priority to higher abstractions in the list, and if we have concrete value, we will use that. Let's examine an example for calculating an abstract, an abstract value. This is a two-step process. First, we will use a pointer-aware slicing to build a slice tree, and then we will use it to calculate the abstracted value. We start by the RSI uh, register from the connect call site. We'll start by following the uh, value stored in the RSI. We see that just before the call, the RSI gets, is assigned the value of RDI. We will now follow it, its value. We see that the value of RDI was assigned from a memory address, RBP minus 50. We will also follow the pointers. In this case, we see that RDI is not used as a pointer. We keep following uh, the values. We see that RBP is never assigned inside the procedure. On the other hand, we see that the address of RBP minus 50 is assigned another value. And we keep following this one, RDI. We see that this is not assigned in another place in the procedure and the pointers are not changed. Given the slice tree, we will place tags to, and propagate them to calculate the final representation or abstraction for our uh, register. RDI is used as an argument for the procedure and receives the tag arg. RBP is used to point to the stack and it receives the tag stack. Now we can start and propagate the values downwards. First, we see that argument is competing with the no information, so argument uh, will carry on and same for stack. Now we have a conflicting uh, tags. We see the stack against argument. We remind ourselves that we will use the priority in the list and argument is placed above the stack because it gives more information about the value. And so argument will be propagated downwards. And finally, we will use arg abstraction for the RSI to represent the RSI register. We note that while our examples were based on external API calls, we will perform the same steps for other types of calls. These results in the set of paths of augmented call sites. We take these paths and place the augmented call sites back in the CFG to create the augmented control flow graph. This will allow, this will allow us to use an LSTM and transformer modules for this set of paths and the GNN modules for our graph. Next, we will evaluate our approach. We have implemented it in a prototype we called Nero, which is available online. We built our evaluation comps, comp corpus using GNU software packages from the GNU software repositories. We invested a lot of effort in cleaning them up and making sure to remove test code and any duplications. Then we stripped all the created compiled executables and split the dataset into a, using an 811 split into training, validation, and test using a package based split. This means that all the executables created from a specific package will be uh, assigned to the same set. This is important to avoid uh, name leakage and other undesired consequences with, which affects the F1 scores. One more thing we wanted to do is obfuscate the API names. This essentially causes the call sites to lose the name of the uh, called API. And it was important for us to uh, understand how important are they to the representation and making sure that our representation can work without them. This dataset is also available online. In our evaluation, we compared ourselves to two groups of baselines. The first one is the vanilla LSTM and transformer text modules in which we fed the disassembled code. We also compared ourselves to two uh, recent works Debian, which is a non-neural model, and Dire, which is based on decompiled binaries. For our approach, we had three variations based on LSTM, Transformer, and GNNs. As we can see in this bar chart showing F1 scores for each model, 
Overall, our modules outperformed all the other modules. Specifically, our GNN variation is the best achieving module. We see that uh, our modules outperformed on average the vanilla module text modules by 80% and the, our best module outperformed the best competing module by almost 30%. Now we move to the results of uh, the second dataset, which is script and obfuscated API calls and showing them side by side with the script dataset. As we can see, all the models suffered uh, degradation in F1 score results, but still our GNN module is the best uh, performing uh, compared to the other modules. We moved to an ablation study, which we used to ascertain a uh, grasp on the different parts of our uh, system and how each one contributes to the final uh, model. First, we only took the first step, focusing on the APIs and other calls. As we can see, this result is slightly better than the vanilla ones using just LSTM, but it's still far gone from the final best result. Next, we augmented these call sites. This contributes to a very big increase in the F1 scores, but we are still far from the final results. Then we tried placing the calls, and only the, the calls without augmentation, in the right pass. This, again, slightly increased the result, but still it is a far gone from the final result. And just by augmenting the call sites, we see an almost 50% increase in F1 scores. After we had finished our test, we wanted to perform qualitative evaluation and examine cases in which our module performed partial predictions. We tallied the errors and we noticed three major uh, groups of errors. The first one, we dubbed programmers versus the English language. In essence, programmers tend to use shorthands, which causes these mixed predictions. In this case, the ground proof was a non-shorthand uh, full term initialized, but because our module saw in the training phase the init shorthand many times, it has predicted that one instead. A more complex example here is the where the programmer uh, used config, which is a shorthand for config, which is itself a shorthand for configure, and this is why the model chose that instead of these unknown, not very uh, Apparent in the model, in the, in the training set, a shorthand of a shorthand. The next group is that we call data structure name missing. In this case, the model was missing the name of the data structure being used by the programmer again and again. In this case, we see that the programmer gave the name get best speed, but the model had no idea that this list is actually a list of speeds, and so it predicted the get list item uh, instead. A more complex example here is the FTP parse WinNTLS, essentially parsing of the directive directory tree for the Windows system in an FTP connection, while the model only saw a parsing of a tree, and this is the predicted name. The third group is just verb replacements. We see read replaced by parse, retrieve replaced, replaced by get, and display replaced by show. At the end of this process, we concluded that the measured F1 score is actually a lower bound for the usefulness of our uh, approach because these predicted names are very useful for the programmer. It's also not customary to uh, fix these results manually, and so we left the results as they were. That's it. I leave you with two takeaway messages. Augmented call sites serve as a strong basis for procedure representation and that reconstructing the CFG enables the use of sequence-to-sequence -sequence and GNN modules. Generally, we recommend combining binary program analysis with machine learning to find a sweet spot and solve many different tasks. We really think that there is a lot of room for more work in this field. Also, check out our GitHub repository for more resources and information. Thank you very much.